for those who are interested in high paid jobs, perhaps the sign should have been don't listen to whatever these guys, academics, are going to tell you. But it's not about high pay, low pay that we're discussing here. We're discussing the future of work, and it sounds very economics, it sounds very labor economics, it sounds very analytical and behavioral, and of course it is. But what we hope to achieve, what we hope to achieve by inviting you, the business community or the larger community, so not only academics, I hope, and not only people working um, uh, for the European uh, community or the European Commission or for institutions or as civil servants, we really hope to attract with everything we do, we really hope to attract the business community because the future of work is their future. And if we later on will discuss inequality and the role of inequality or the consequences of inequality for the economy and society we know it is and should be their business and if we're later on going to generate here on a day-to-day -day basis we're talking about the start of a bigger a much bigger adventure you know this school is an ambitious school and it is a well-located school it has its reputation and its history but we've never really as Solve opened the doors clearly and with a lot of noise to the world, not only of business, but to the world of uh, policy makers. Yeah. And of course our economics professors have lots of connections and relations and they do lots of consulting and research for this public sector and regulation and policy. But we've never really tried to bring the two worlds together. And as I'm convinced and as our school is convinced that the big challenges that we are facing um, uh, today are challenges that cannot only be solved, nor by the private sector on its own, nor by the public sector on its own. We believe a kind of a fusion, um, a kind of a, a working together, and a better understanding, a better understanding um, by these and for these two worlds. We hope that we can increase public management, the quality of public management, by creating a much better understanding of business needs on the part of the public sector and the policy makers and equally and equally important we try to um, make business understand that in a complex world and the world we live in is a complex world with many challenges that businesses in whatever system we work cannot and should not um, try to solve problems on their own and that an interaction with policy and policy making in function of society and the well-being of society in function of businesses and the well-being of businesses is what we need because at the end we have businesses that create value for society and policymakers. Policymakers should also try to focus on the um, creation of added value for society. So tonight we discuss the future of work and let me proudly um, and I've got the honor to introduce to you our <coughs> keynote speakers Laszlo Andor, the Secretary General of the Foundation for European Progressive Studies and Professor at the UNB's Institute for um, European Studies. We have David Otter, the fourth Professor of Economics at MIT. Uh, his scholarship explores the labor market impacts of technological <coughs> change and globalization on job polarization, skill demands, earnings levels and inequality and electoral outcomes. We have Sir Richard Blondel. So Richard Blundell is a David Ricardo Professor of Political Economy at the University College of London and Research Director of the very well-known Institute for Fiscal Studies, IFS. We also have David um, Hemus. Do I pronounce that correctly? <laughs> David Hemus, Associate Professor of the Economics and Innovation and Entrepreneurship endowed by the UBS Center at the University of Zurich working on economic growth. In particular, his uh, David's research is focused on the role of green innovation in climate policy and the effect of technological <coughs> change on inequality. The moderator perhaps needs no introduction, but let me introduce Sihiraja de Semzer de Boissesson. Boissesson? Yeah. Boissesson. <laughs> She's the uh, CEO of Politico Europe, and she sits on the advisory board at Georgetown's Master of Science in Foreign Service and on the board of directors of the French-American Foundation 
Welcome to you all, welcome to our speakers. The floor is yours and I'm glad to introduce, I think I'm supposed to introduce Frank, but the floor is yours, Frank. Right. Well, I'll be very brief, but, I, but, I, but first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for coming, it's particularly the speakers and uh, Shazam Zad also have to come to moderate, but also have everyone to participating today. Um, I'm from Georgetown University and uh, one of the objectives of Georgetown University is that uh, we like to think of, uh, we, we, we want to be a global institution and uh, that means that we want to reach out to, uh, to, um, to other institutions to face, uh, face uh, challenges, uh, which, to address challenges which the world, face, the world is facing with the hope, the idea of uh, providing some answers. And along those lines we've, uh, we've started this uh, network which you can see up there, the Global Network for Global Economic Challenges. And we've got, um, so today's the inaugural event, so it's very exciting from that perspective. And it's even more exciting because we've got several of the, of the, of the institutes, representatives of the institutions who are part of the network, Olympia, Manuel, Abigail, and uh, Sir Richard, of course. Uh, so um, it's great to have all of you here to get us off to such a great start. And, uh, on that, I'll hand over to Mikhail to present the speakers. Thank you. So, um, Frank introduced the, the network. Frank has been instrumental, and Joshua has been instrumental at creating this, uh, this global network, uh, which would span continents. Uh, what we want to do here at ULV, uh, I already in Philippe Harwin explained that very well, we want to uh, be part of these new dynamics. Brussels and Washington are the key capitals for legislation and define the way a business can work. Uh, and we think there is way too little uh, understanding, way too little effort at creating this communication. So when academics meet, they do what we've done during the day. They talk uh, between academics. And what we are much less good at is to uh, communicate. And by communication, I mean really multilateral communication. Uh, where we can listen, we need to learn to listen and we need to learn to communicate to people who are not necessarily academics. And people in my family will tell me that it's not very easy. What we look like are like doctors who demonstrate like this. This is the quality of our communication so far. Uh, pretty unintelligible. And so I really want to thank also uh, the authors and Sheikh Hazad for helping us also uh, create this bridge with uh, this dialogue with the, the people who are not necessarily into academia. Uh, I think, I trust that what we are doing is relevant, is useful, but we need to learn how to communicate uh, that outside, and we need also to learn uh, what are the issues that you think are not uh, correctly addressed by what we are doing. So this is what we are here tonight. As uh, Philippe explained, this is the first event of a series. Uh, we want to uh, really start concentrating and improve our capacity at understanding the best, uh, the most important policy challenges, economic policy challenges, because this is what we can talk about. Uh, and without further ado, I want to uh, give the floor to Sherazad now and the uh, presenter. Thank you so much. It's a real honor to be here tonight um, and really excited about the partnership between Georgetown and uh, ULB, two great locations, Washington and Brussels, the two locations that decide a lot in our lives every day in policy making. Uh, there's other cities obviously growing on the other side of the Pacific which are changing our lives too. Tonight, I really, we're very keen to, after we're gonna have presentations, but afterwards to make sure this is also a dialogue, we have questions, and hopefully we can open up the discussion to uh, beyond the economics, but also into the policy making. We're going to start off with David Otter, who's going to give us a framework, <coughs> followed by David Emus, who's going to start going into the policy. Uh, Last Lander, who is a former EU commissioner, can give us some experience de terrain, as we would say, as a policy maker and having uh, had a key role in, in, in implementing these policies. And then, very honored to have Sir Richard Wundell. Uh, wrap up but also open up the discussion so we can really have a hopefully an exciting discussion for the for the coming hour or so. Um, each presenter, David, we're going to start a round, we've given them 10 to 15 minutes with the magic 12 minutes um, and then we will be taking, uh, we will do the presentations and then open up to questions. Thank you so much.
can now see all the slides in reverse. Okay, great. Is the mic oh, Chris working? Uh, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, my name is David Otter. I'm the uh, Ford Professor of Economics at MIT and also um, the co-director of the MIT Work of the Future Task Force that, who, that is tasked to investigate and explore the <coughs> challenges and opportunities pre presented uh, by the evolution of work. So let me just jump right in. Um, if you think about it, and if the clicker works, um, cool. Uh, many, of the, many of the great inventions of the last 200 years were designed to replace labor with machines. So uh, tractors were invented to substitute uh, internal combustion engines for uh, animal and human muscle power. Uh, assembly lines were designed to replace uh, you know, slow artisanal work with kind of machine precision. Uh, computers were built to uh, replace cumbersome, error-prone human calculation with digital perfection. And these inventions have worked. So we no longer, uh, we no longer dig ditches by hand. We don't pound tools out of wrought iron. Uh, we don't do bookkeeping with actual books. Uh, so it's been an enormous success, and it's displaced an enormous amount of labor from very labor-intensive activities. And yet, uh, over the last 130 years, the fraction of adults in the paid labor force has generally risen in almost every decade. And to the degree it's declined, it's declined very modestly. A lot of that, of course, reflects the movement of women from unpaid, uh, extremely restrictive and often grueling labor in household production to paid work in the labor market where they have more uh, options, more opportunity for creativity and exercise and expertise. Um, and so, uh, but this raises the question, which is why Despite all this automation and our enormous success at automation, why are there still so many jobs remaining? Why haven't we made our skills redundant and our expertise obsolete? So I want to talk about that very briefly in these few minutes. I, and I want to make uh, four, four points I want to talk about. First, why are there so many jobs? What specifically are the economic forces? Two, um, where does new work come from, given that we've displaced so much old work? Three, um, what should we worry about? Uh, and I'm going to argue it's not about the number of jobs. And fourth, uh, how do we shape uh, the things, how do we shape the future in a way uh, that we can uh, feel optimistic about? So really there are two answers to why there are so many jobs, actually. The first one I'm going to call complementarity. Um, so uh, here's a great example from uh, James Besson, who's an economist and historian at Boston University. Um, in the decades after the introduction of the automated teller machine, you know, those, those vending machines that dispense money, um, the number of bank tellers in the United States actually roughly doubled. Uh, and you might ask yourself, what are all those bank tellers doing? Like, why weren't they eliminated? Most people think they're, they're, that you know, bank tellers were eliminated by ATMs, but they weren't. Um, and the answer is, so, you know, just as you would expect, when bank that ATMs were introduced, the number of tellers per branch fell by about a third. But then banks quickly discovered that once they had a, uh, ATMs, they could introduce open new branches really cheaply because they just had a, a machine and a couple of tellers. And so um, they expanded output. And so the number of tellers per branch fell, but the number of branches rose even more. But that's kind of too simple a story because simultaneously the job of the teller changed. They went from you know, being just kind of a, a money handler to someone who was kind of <coughs> problem solving, customer service. You know, uh, helping customers figure out what's going wrong and introduce them to new products and services like loans, uh, you know, credit cards, investments, things they may or may not have needed. Um, now, this example is kind of specific to, to bank tellers, but it illustrates a broader point, which is that most jobs involve a kind of a panoply of tasks, a set of things, you know, perspiration and inspiration, you know, uh, routine uh, hand, uh, information processing and judgment and creativity and expertise. And those things are complementary. They need to be done together. You can't just do more of one and less of the other. What that means is that as you automate and make one set of tasks much more efficient and more productive, the value of the remaining tasks increases. So as automation substitutes some subset of our work, it amplifies the value of judgment, of expertise, and creativity in the work that remains. Right? So one piece of this, why has an automation limit our work, is it, it increases the value of what remains. That's part of it. A second part of it is what I'm going to call insatiability. So you might say to yourself, well, let's think about it. Isn't it the case that if we get sufficiently productive at something, we're eventually kind of out of a job? And a partial answer to that is yes. So this shows you the evolution of uh, agricultural employment in the United States. 
Uh, in 1900, 38% of all U.S. employment was on farms. By 2000, that was under 2%, and it's still falling. And in some sense, it's amazing technological progress. I mean, it's a century of improvement in fertilization, in irrigation, in genetics, in uh, tractors. It means that a couple million people can feed a population of over 330 million and export food. So it's remarkable progress, but clearly that you know, generational increase in productivity has eventually uh, you know, produced us out of a job. There are just not many farming jobs left anymore. And that's true in many places. It's not unique to agriculture. However, what's true for an individual sector, an individual activity, has never been true for the economy as a whole. Because as we raise wealth and increase the scope of things we can do, simultaneously we create new products, new services, and new ideas that create work, spur consumption, and occupy people's time and attention. So, uh, you know, many of the industries in which people work today, right, so it would be you know, finance, uh, software and services, uh, healthcare, were tiny or almost non-existent 100 years ago. Many of the things they spend their money on, you know, sport utility vehicles, uh, air conditioning, portable electronics, didn't even exist, right? So um, this is what you might call, you know, never get enough, you might call insatiability. We have never reached a point in human history where we're so wealthy that we stop consuming stuff, that we're just like, ah, oh, we're done, we're full, we're sat satisfied, right? People's consumption demands rise about 1.1 times the rate of their income growth. So no matter how wealthy we get, we seem to demand more stuff. And this leads to new activities that create new demand for labor. But now let me zoom in a little bit further. That's kind of a short answer. But it's important to realize that a, a, key, a component of this is not simply doing the same things more productively, but, but creating new stuff to do. So where does that come from? Well, I'm going to say it comes from four places. So one is, uh, I'm, I'm going to call Uber effects. You could just call these ATM effects, right? So Uber made uh, personal transportation much more efficient. Right? And although that reduced the number of taxi cab drivers, it massively increased the number of people employed in transportation services, and personal transportation. Right? So often, if you just make a product cheaper and better, employment goes up, not goes down. Because although it's more productive and more efficient, demand goes up even more. A second is what I'm going to call Walmart effects, just that whenever you lower the price of one thing, it frees up income. Right? And then people tend to spend that income on other stuff. Right? So you know, I'm from the United States. Our, our, ne our national savings rate is like negative 5%. So whenever you know, income rises, we just you know, find something else to spend it on. Right? Um, the third is what I'm going to call network effects. Right? So uh, it is the case that the amount of human labor in a ton of steel has fallen by 85% over the course of 30 years. That's remarkable. It means if you used to use 100 people to make a ton of steel, you now use 15 people. And as a result, employment in steel manufacturing has fallen. It would have fallen even without Chinese imports, although it fell more. However, so you say, well, that's, that's clearly job reducing. But not really. Because think of the millions of people employed in aircraft, in metal manufacturing, in automobile producing, in construction, all of which use steel as an input. When the price of steel falls, as it will when productivity rises, their demand rises. Right? So it actually creates employment in all these customer sectors. Similarly, if you are producing iron ore or electricity or transportation services, more of those inputs will be used by the steel industry as productivity rises and, and demand from customers rises. So even productivity growth that destroys employment in the sector in which it occurs will generally tend to raise employment in aggregate because of these network effects. Finally, talk about the invention of new work. There is like new stuff that appears. Um, so uh, I'm going to. Uh, this is actually refers to ongoing work with Hannah Solomon's of uh, Utrecht University. I was speaking about this earlier today. And you can look, actually, in the US Census, uh, the United States Census creates catalogs of job titles every decade, and they add new ones. And it's really interesting to see where they come from. So one category of job titles that you see a lot of is what we're going to call frontier jobs. So here is George Jetson. Many of you may know, right? This is a Hanna-Barbera car cartoon from the 1970s and 80s. This was a certain version of the future, and here's George at work. He's a, his job, he's a professional button pusher. And here are some of the new jobs that were created. So in 1980, supervisors were processing, circuit design layouts, artificial intelligence specialists, art, art, I'm just listing these titles that were create, that were enumerated by the US Census Bureau in those decades. Uh, wind turbine technicians, computing services directors. So there's a lot of new work that involves working with, designing, or translating the new technologies. Right? So if you're an echocardiographer, you're not inventing the machine itself, but you're a person who uses that in medicine. Okay? 
So you might think all new work comes from new technology. And many people say, if my kid doesn't know how to be a botnet herder by the time they're 14 in high school, you know, no future for them. That's not true. There's another important set of work that purely comes from rising incomes and has very little to, to do with new technology. So, for example, here's George Jetson again, but now he's at home. And does anyone know who's, who's waiting on him, hand and foot? Rosie. Rosie the robot, thank you. Okay, so here are jobs that were added in 1980. The gift wrapper, fingernail former, horse exerciser, oyster preparer, always popular, uh, sommelier, uh, golf cart mechanic. Uh, that, you know, good timing for the Trump election, right? Uh, and, uh, and so an important part of new work comes from actually just rising incomes. It creates demands for differentiated luxury services, right? There's a lot of labor in that, not all good jobs, but many, many jobs. <coughs> Finally, I should say, there's another set of jobs, also interesting, that we, what we call last mile jobs, accomplishing small bits of work that remain in some previously <coughs> more robust occupation. So for example, so in the Jetsons, by the way, this is the robot football player. For some reason, you still need a person to wind the robot. So that's a last mile job by our definition. Uh, some other examples from the US data, tamale machine feeders, vending machine attendants, chapters, room host and monitor, right? That's a new small job. <laughs> Underground utility cable locators, teleprompters. Okay, so this gives you a sense that there's new work is constantly being created and it's not just the high tech work that you imagine. It's at all points in the distribution, although that has varied over time. Okay, so let me, I realize I'm running out of time, so let me ask, so, so now I've told you, look, we're not running out of jobs, we're creating them at about the same rate we're eliminating them, that doesn't mean it's not disruptive, it is, uh, but it, that you shouldn't be worried about running out of work. So, but I don't want you to think that there's nothing to worry about, I wouldn't want to leave you without something to worry about. So let me talk about what you should worry about. So, the first thing is, well, the economist says nothing to worry about, right? So if you were to look at their issue from, uh, I think this was May of 2019, uh, the zeitgeist has lost touch with the data. Many popular perceptions about the market, labor market are wrong. Dishonesty might be justified whether or not popular perceptions about the world of work. So obviously wrong. And here they point out robust job growth throughout the rich world. So on the task force in which I serve, um, we disagree. We think you should be worried. Here's what you should be worried about. First of all, we should recognize that work is intrinsically important. And we should not think about replacing it with universal basic income. That's not a substitute. There are many reasons you might want to provide UBI, but it's not because you should want to eliminate work. Um, public concern about future work is not misguided. And we can see from the last four decades of economic history why, uh, that, it, it is, uh, why that, that concern is valid. This figure kind of makes the point. This shows you in the United States the relationship between aggregate productivity growth and wage growth from the post-war 1948 to 2017. So what you can see is overall productivity growth, average worker compensation, and professional compensation move in tandem from 1948 to approximately 1980. So if we're standing 1980, I can say to you, don't worry about automation. It raises productivity and everybody benefits. Right? But now look what happens after the mid-1970s. Right? Productivity growth continues to rise. That would be that line. Here's the wages of professional workers. They rise along with them. And then here's the median worker or the median supervisor, non-supervisory worker. And they totally flat lines. Right? So what this picture makes clear is you can have a lot of productivity growth without a lot of shared prosperity. Right? So there's every reason to think that we all have technology that will make society richer and yet will make, leave many, many people behind. And that's just, uh, it's clear that that has occurred. Um, you can also see this in the divergence of earnings in the United States. These are from bottom to top, high school dropout, high school grad, some college, college grad, greater than college. And what you can see is, again, from that same moment forward, wages have massively diverged with increasing real earnings among the highly educated and falling real earnings among the less educated. Right? So that's consistent with that figure I showed you a moment ago. So that's really problematic. Um, I won't sit just to, in the interest of time. Let me just skip ahead. It's also the case, remarkably, that in the last 10 years, productivity has slowed, across, productivity growth has slowed across the rich world. Um, and uh, even, and it's uncorrelated with computer use. So it's not that the countries have had more productivity slowdown are the ones that are using more computers or fewer computers. We don't know why, but it's a big problem, right? We need that productivity growth. It's not sufficient for shared prosperity, but it's necessary, right? Without robust productivity growth, it's hard to do a lot of good stuff. Um, so 
here I'm going to close up by talking about what I see as challenges and opportunities. Okay, so here's the first thing. Clearly, an important part of responding to the way the economy is changing is raising skills at the rate of changing opportunity. So I showed you most of the wage growth has been in college and post-college educated jobs. Well, if we create more workers with those skills, it has three good effects. One, it benefits those individuals, right? Highly educated individuals will learn a lot more. Two, it actually reduces inequality because it will lower wages in those activities because when you increase supply, wages will fall. Three, it will actually raise the wages of people who don't go on for higher education because it makes them relatively scarcer, right? So there's lots of reasons to favor skills investment. But of course, you knew that. That's uncontroversial. It's boring. And everybody says that. So here's something else. We need to align incentives to invest in both human and physical capital. The tax code in all rich countries favors companies spending money on capital, even when it's spending money to replace workers. And we don't have parallel tax incentives to invest in human capital. And so our <coughs> economic structure is biased towards subsidizing firms to eliminate labor and replace it with machines. And in some cases, that's good. In some cases, that's really not good. But we don't think hard about how to fix those incentives. A third thing is uh, to address the coming era of labor scarcity. So in every advanced country, the share of young people in the population is falling considerably. So here are, for example, uh, de age dependency ratios for the EU. So this is the green line is 2018, the blue line is 2050. This is the fraction of people over 65 relative to the number of people uh, 16, 15 to 65. And you can see that age dependency ratio is rising on average from about a third to somewhere to 50, 60%, which means that you know, for every 10 adults who are working in Italy, you'll have six adults who are retired. That's going to create all kinds of labor pressure, pressure on the labor market. If you don't believe me, spend a week in aging Japan right, and have a look around. And it means that um, we're actually going to make, need to make people more productive. And we're especially going to run scarce for people who can do physically demanding in-person service work, standing on their feet, fixing things, repairing things. The combination of aging population, restricted immigration, rising education rates, which make people unwilling to do that work, and, uh, and then the, the disproportionate mass older workers means we're going to face the labor crunch in the decades ahead. That's a challenge and an opportunity. It's a challenge, of course, because scarcity is challenging. It's an opportunity because it means there's an opportunity to improve the quality of work. If you want to get people to do those jobs, you have to pay them a lot. If you're going to have to pay them a lot, you better figure out how to make them more productive. So we should be focused on that problem. Finally, making innovation more productive. There's a lot of innovation that is actually entertaining, but not especially productive. And there's a lot of great innovation that's highly productive, but it may not be going on. And this, again, refers to aligning incentives. And I won't take more time to discuss that now than how to talk about it during the question and answer session. So let me just conclude. My main conclusion is the future will not take care of itself. We should not think there's nothing to worry about. The challenge ahead is not scarcity of jobs. There will be scarcity of workers, not scarcity of jobs. However, abundant jobs does not guarantee abundant good jobs. In fact, the last four decades have been abundant jobs with a real bifurcation of job quality, with a lot of great jobs for highly educated and a lot of pretty crappy jobs for people without high levels of education and a very, very non-robust and contracting middle. Moreover, abundant technology uh, does not necessarily get, guarantee faster productivity growth as we see in the present era. Um, and that's a problem that we need to understand better and fix. And so the main thing is when you worry about the future, as you should, you should be worried not about running out of work, but about improving the quality of work and the incentives that create innovation, that create a positive form of dis uh, distribution of income, and that make work more productive for people who need a raise. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. As well, and in fact, there are going to be some uh, similarities with uh, the presentation of David, including uh, my first slide. You've already seen this picture, uh, <laughs> and so as you can see, this is uh, an assembly line. This is how we use to produce cars. And what is automation? Well, we used to produce cars like that. Now we produce cars like this. This is a Ford plant, this is a Fiat plant, but this has nothing to do with geographical space. This is only the passage of time and, uh, you know, much better technology today. Um, so, so the automation is a form of technical change. It's not really new. Already at the beginning of, uh, sorry, 
Uh, origins uh, 19th century, the Luddites, uh, as you may know, were smashing machines because they were afraid to be uh, replaced by, uh, by machines. Um, in fact, is, I'm going to read you this quote. It's a quote from Time magazine. It says the following, so the number of jobs lost to more efficient machines is only part of the problem. What worries many job experts more is that automation may prevent the economy from creating enough new jobs. Many of the losses in factory jobs have been countered by an increase in the service industries or in office jobs. But automation is begin, beginning to move in and eliminate office jobs too. Do you want to guess from when that is from? So you're not too far, it's from 1961. Okay. Uh, so this is a type of worries that we have for a long time. And, you know, there is this question, will there still be many jobs, but to reuse uh, what David uh, said, well, this is not really the right question. The right question is maybe why are there st still so many jobs there? And in fact, as David pointed out, one argument, one type of explanation is we also create new jobs, we create new products, new services. So automation is a form of technological change, but it's not the only one. Okay, so just to give Again, some examples, so for instance, these jobs clearly did not exist in the 1910s. If you look a bit more carefully at the pictures, they probably still do not, uh, they, many of them uh, may not exist anymore because these computers uh, look a little bit old. Uh, to make this a bit more clear, these are uh, switchboard operators. They came, of course, with the invention of the telephone. In 1970, these, these, there were 421,000 switchboard operators in the US, so that's a huge amount of work amount of female work. Today, this has decreased a lot. You may still be surprised when there's still uh, close to 100,000 uh, switchboard operators. So jobs don't really completely disappear, but they can decline uh, quite dramatically. Okay? Now, if we have different type of innovations, then to understand the future of technology, it's important to understand how to measure the amount of automation that exists in innovation, and therefore to understand whether innovation is going to be more directed towards automation innovations or toward maybe the creation of new products or new services. Okay, so that's something that we can do. So that's what we're doing in a, in a recent paper with co-authors. We're trying to measure the amount of automation innovations in specifically machinery. Okay, so you can make different machine tools. Some of them are going to try to replace workers. Others are going to be more precise or allow you to reduce energy demand. For instance, they're not going to be devoted to replace labor. So you can measure that, and this is in patterns, that's a share of patterns uh, that corresponds to automation machinery, depending on the country of innovation. What you can see is that you have some increase over time in most, uh, most countries, so the US, UK, Germany, particularly actually in recent years, so there is some small increase in automation. Japan looks a little bit different, it was already pretty high in the 80s, and then it has actually slightly declined. Um, now we can use this to figure out, well, what are the consequences of automation? So David explained that, well, if I am able to automate and use a machine, then what this machine is going to do is going to replace workers at tasks that are easily codifiable. So we're going to replace workers at routine tasks. So this is just some correlation between our measure of the share of automation patterns in different sectors in the US and just changing tasks in the 80, well, from uh, 1980 to 1998. Okay, and so what you find is that what the sectors that experience the most automation, scientific equipment, electronic equipment, appliance, radio TV, transport equipment here, are all sectors that saw a big decline in routine cognitive tasks. Okay? So that's the same thing if you look at routine manual tasks, same, same sectors that experience a lot of automation and are being associated with a decline in manual tasks. Okay, so that's kind of the effect of automation on labor markets, but a reverse question is, well, what's going to happen if we have changed in labor markets? Is this going to lead to more automation? So, for instance, this is a, uh, you know, a demonstration in front of an Amazon warehouse for a $15 minimum wage. One thing that you may be worried about is that this could lead to the Amazon warehouse looking more and more like that, okay, with robots. This guy already exists. This one is a little bit more advanced than what we have today. So that's something that we'd like to measure, and that's what we, we're doing in, a, in another project where we're trying to look at how much an increase in wages is going to lead to more automation innovation. Okay, so we, we ended up using patent data on firms and looking at how different firms were affected by trends in labor costs across different countries to measure that. And what we ended up finding is that indeed firms respond a lot to an increase uh, in wages. 
Okay, so specifically, we found that a 10% increase in the low skill wage faced by the customers of a robot producer or an equipment producer more generally would lead to around 20% more automation patterns. Okay, that's a pretty large, that's a pretty large effect. To illustrate that, you can look. Uh, so this is uh, within our data. The, the sh in blue, you have the share of firms that well, the share of patents by our firms that do uh, that are related to automation. If you were to increase wages by 10%, then our estimates to you know be associated with the red line in, uh, instead. Okay, that's an increase which is roughly of the same magnitude as the increase that happens in the data between 1995 and 2011. Okay. So this is one way to look at this. There's another way to look at the effect of policy is to, uh, here we, for instance, we're looking at the effect of the arts reform in Germany. So this were policies that aimed at making labor markets more flexible, particularly for low skilled workers. Because you're making labor markets more flexible, that should reduce incentives of firms to adopt automation technologies. Okay, so what we did here is that we compared uh, the amount of automation innovation by non-German firms that are more or less exposed to Germany. Okay, so this trend tells you whether non-German firms tend to do uh, more or less automation innovations when they're more exposed to Germany? The answer is that yes, all the way to 2003. But then from 2003, which is after the, uh, at the time <coughs> of the implementation of the arts reform, this trend reverses. So if you're an American firm highly exposed to Germany, you used to do more automation innovation in the past, and then you tend to do less. <coughs> yes. Okay. Um, so what are the consequences of this? Well, the first consequence is that actually maybe you should expect automation to rise over time. Why? Because if technological progress leads overall still to an increase in wages, then work is becoming more expensive. If work is becoming more expensive, the incentive to actually automate should increase over time. This should not happen overnight and not all jobs are going to disappear uh, very quickly. But it's not so surprising that we see increases in the share of automation innovation. The second thing is that if I want to think about policies, then it's actually very important to think about, uh, to distinguish between policies that are going to try to raise labor costs or policies that are going to try uh, to lower labor costs, even though both types of policy may try to help the same type of people. So if you think about an increase in the minimum wage, for instance, then we may worry that this is going to lead to a lot of uh, fancy robots. Actually, if we think about the minimum wage, you probably want to have really, relatively large increase uh, because the jobs that are automatable are not necessarily the one at the lowest, lowest level. But the $15 minimum wage, that's something that you may, you may worry about. Um, on the other hand, a policy is, uh, such as the harsh reforms that made low uh, skill labor uh, less costly or a negative tax, so the earned income tax credit in the US, they tend to be policies that are going to increase the supply of labor uh, of low skill labor, they should be associated with less and less, uh, less rob fewer robots and less fancy robots. Okay. And something such as a robot tax, or more generally a tax on capital, would also be something that over time should be associated with uh, fewer and uh, less fancy robots. Another consequence that actually taxing the robot and taxing the guys that make the robot are actually very different. If I tax a robot, I'm going to reduce the use of existing automation technologies by firm. So that's going to tend to boost wages. But if I tax this guy, that actually this is a tax on firms that are not yet automated. And the firms that are not yet automated are firms that tend to use a lot of low-skill labor. So that may be a, these type of taxes uh, may very easily backfire and in fact reduce uh, low-skill wages. Okay, so just to conclude, well, we tend to think of, you know, the effect of technological progress on wages, and we tend to think of policy as something that's going to help, you know, help increase wages, for instance, or reduce the negative impact of technological change on wages. But re in reality, the t there are also these two reactions. Wages also affect technological change, and policy in return may affect technological change directly. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting. It's a pleasure to um, be able to speak um, among real experts of this topic. But I understand that in a panel like this, there's a need also for a policymaker or a former policymaker. 
Um, and this is exactly where the previous presentation concluded, the role of policy. And um, exactly that's where I would like to continue. But before explaining the policies and speaking about institutions and some of the uh, very important institutions <coughs> and their connection with um, employment and uh, working conditions, I would like to join those who emphasized that this discussion is not entirely new. It's a new chapter in a long, long uh, series of discussions about how technology affects um, life and uh, employment and working conditions. Now I have to figure out um, where uh, exactly how to uh, step with this. Uh, these are uh, three different uh, front pages of uh, Der Spiegel from Germany. Uh, the first one we found uh, comes from 1964. <coughs> Uh, but the, 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 the style of the uh, graphic illustration is um, very, very similar and uh, we realize that much of the illustrations uh, that are still used in the discussions um, actually come from some of the previous rounds of uh, the, the same discussion when um, uh, the fear that machines in general, but specifically robots, computers, uh, and you name them, would threaten our opportunities in the labor market uh, were heavily and intensely uh, discussed. We found that there have been many, many factors that contributed to job destruction in the past uh, period, but uh, uh, the list of these factors is very, very diverse. And, um, and, and very often uh, the, 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 the impact of the technology is more sectoral uh, rather than an aggregate uh, impact. Another illustration of uh, the need to avoid, uh, uh, let's say, um, you know, being dominated by the perception and to distinguish between the perception and, uh, and, and, and the actual reality. This is an example of the first chess robot that has been invited, invented uh, about 250 years ago, the so-called mechanical Turk. Uh, we consider the inventor a Hungarian, and um, that's not uh, connected with the fact that the first chess robot was actually a fraud, uh, because um, in reality uh, it, it misled a lot of people, uh, but in reality there was a human uh, hidden in that uh, box, and somehow this is a good illustration uh, that um, the the, the, the innovations, the inventions of uh, uh, our time might be very, very impressive, but there are humans behind what you can really see. Technology, as um, one of the American uh, colleagues um, actually working for the University of Edinburgh, Karen Gregory, uh, was emphasizing technology is also labor. Um, it's also people who make the platforms, people who make the machines, and um, if you ask the individuals involved in the new forms of employment, for example, the gig economy, they will also tell you that they want uh, 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 leverage, they want bargaining power, they want decent working conditions, and flexibility is very often appreciated because it responds well to the life situations, which can be very, very diverse, but it should also come with dignity and it should be reconciled with the achievements of um, uh, improving labor conditions um, in the past uh, centuries. And culture matters for the working conditions as such and also the diversity we found in um, the very diverse labor markets. Another interesting question is the speed of the change. Um, another illustration for that is uh, the first automated restaurant. I'm sure you were wondering when you came here when exactly the first automated restaurant was established in Budapest, right? That was a question on your mind. If uh, you want to get some help, uh, this was the first advert for this restaurant, and that's what it looked like. It actually was opened in 1898, it looks like, 1898, so late 19th century. Already there was one in Berlin, and subsequently, uh, this is still a picture from the first one, and subsequently, in the interval period, there were many others. So there was a kind of fashion for automated restaurants at that time. But what we are left with is 
uh, just very few examples and concentrating in transport. Uh, why? Because despite it would be possible, people, in my view, do not want automated restaurants. People, unless they are really in a rush, which happens in transport, if you need to very quickly uh, pick up some food and drink, uh, people would like to sit down and have a decent meal served by humans. Um, there is a temptation to automate, um, uh, uh, for example, music in the restaurant, but if you have a choice, I also believe that you want music played by the humans as opposed to played by the machines, which is much more uh, frequent uh, nowadays. But not the entire service of the restaurants has been automated, at least not in Hungary. There's actually an infinite demand for waiters in uh, Hungarian uh, restaurants because those who are well trained, they all left for Austria uh, for much higher uh, wages. Uh, now, uh, coming to the European policies, but also policies of other important uh, organizations, I would uh, also shortly address the OECD, which has done uh, remarkable work in this field, and, and the International Labour Organization. Starting with uh, the European Union, um, which uh, not very recently, but exactly 10 years ago, launched the so-called Europe 2020 strategy. I had a little bit of work also uh, with that. And this illustration, I think, um, is a remarkable example of a um, little bit naive approach to all these uh, questions. Uh, I think the way the strategy was presented um, uh, tells you that something absolutely remarkable is coming to change your life and improving your, your, your life prospect. You have a digital agenda, you have an innovation union, and apparently a light bulb is going to be invented. Uh, that's also something that very recent, but that was uh, the way, um, apparently, um, which was seen as suitable for illustrating how cool everything is. I think all these stars are supposed to tell you that the digital agenda, the new industrial policy, the new skills and jobs, uh, they're quite cool policies and they will improve uh, life. If I look back on how the digital agenda was seen at that time, it was primarily about uh, the need to invest in Europe in order to catch up with the USA and Japan, feeling the need uh, uh, to, to coordinate these investments much more. And the labor market side was simply seen as an opportunity to take advantage of a new sector. Uh, not so much um, a horizontal issue, but more as a specific sector where the demand is growing and Europe within five or six years time would need an additional million programmers. And the question was how to deliver the economy this additional one million programmers uh, who would live happily ever after. Now, of course, it was subsequently understood that the issue is much more uh, complex, and if I want to sum up the key concerns which have been discussed in the EU institutions in the past about five, six years, uh, there are practically three main chapters. One is about employment, <coughs> i.e. job displacement, and how uh, new technology would affect the number of jobs, the, the, the availability of, 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 of jobs. The second is uh, working conditions, uh, how a uh, serious problem, for example, the precariousness and the insecurity uh, would be if we give uh, green light to all the transformations which uh, are possible at the time. And the third chapter, um, the social protection. Whether the technological change and the new forms of business and employment which are created in this period would open little avenues or maybe greater channels out of the social security systems and progressively undermine the welfare state in, uh, uh, in, in, in Europe. Um, I think if you look at the dynamic of uh, uh, these concerns, then after some point, indeed, we stopped worrying about the number of jobs but we started to worry about uh, uh, working conditions and to some extent about social protection as well. Now, as compared to these concerns, uh, what the EU institutions have delivered, I would say, is marginally uh, touching uh, uh, these issues. There have been a discussion, a broad consultation, by the way, about the so-called European pillar of social rights, 
in order to ensure that the welfare states and the working conditions remain robust uh, also in the future. But this so-called pillar eventually became a collection of 20 non-binding principles. So not the most powerful instrument the European Union can put forward. Um, a new EU uh, skills agenda was also um, adopted. Again, this is a kind of strategic uh, document providing orientation and recommendations. Um, uh, and some work has been done also on um, uh, related uh, uh, health and safety risks, uh, especially what concerns musculoskeletal uh, disorders, which a lot of people unfortunately experience due to the very mechanical way to, uh, to work with uh, computers uh, in the office without too much uh, movement. So these risks are often overlooked, uh, but in a way this is also the responsibility of the public uh, 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 offices and, 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 and officials uh, that while promoting investment in the new technology also assess and try to manage the risk which is associated and the risk can be all different uh, types. Uh, the analysis provided for these EU policies um, was summed up um, in a 2016 um, a, a paper, not the most recent, uh, feeding on what the OECD and the ILO and another EU agency, which is <coughs> on skills, the SEDEF uh, uh, provided. Now, that brings us to the question of the OECD, because I, as I mentioned, the OECD has really uh, carried out a, a very comprehensive uh, research and reassessment and concluded with uh, a new job strategy, which was ad adopted, published, and, uh, and popularized uh, last year. One important chapter, chapter of, of this is about uh, regulation, which practically is revisiting the old paradigm of the OECD, which in the <coughs> 1990s was still focusing on flexibility and advocating flexibility without um, ambiguity. Uh, now, the OECD also is looking at the question of how to combine flexibility with security. Um, they also look at social protection, and then this is this, you know, giving a, f a, a few more details on what I just mentioned before, that if you look at the new types of jobs, the atypical jobs, um, uh, eminently self-employment, uh, more than half of those who are self-employed in Europe, uh, sorry, in OECD countries, do not have access to unemployment benefit. Uh, more than one third do not have access to sickness benefit. Um, almost half uh, of the women do not have access to maternity uh, mm -hmm. uh, benefits. So these are absolutely important pillars of what we consider the welfare state. And if the uh, increasing, the increasing uh, 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 spectrum of self-employment um, is so um, uh, weak on sustaining these standards, uh, there is a re reason to think about it again. Now one way to think about it again is to strengthen or even reinvent the social dialogue, which is not uh, an obvious task after trade union membership falling consistently, which you can see on this uh, chart, but um, something needs to be uh, reconsidered here very clearly. And the other policy which the OECD very clearly started to advocate in EU uh, strategies, it has been a standard uh, for about two decades, lifelong learning. Uh, but lifelong learning in the sense uh, that it should also be a kind of uh, uh, a reality and not only a mantra. Um, if, if you look at uh, which countries here on the left, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, uh, Slovakia, mainly those coming relatively recently, to the European Union and not participating earlier in uh, these uh, strategic uh, considerations, they would need to be the ones uh, to somehow upgrade their business model and also use the EU funds more wisely, namely for investment in human capital and uh, providing the employees in both public and private sectors uh, high-skilled as well as low-skilled um, uh, uh, more opportunities, access to lifelong uh, learning. The one uh, <coughs> point about the ILO, uh, please don't forget the ILO is 100 years old and it could be a separate discussion why the ILO was established as part of the Versailles uh, 
treaty, but it was. And um, in the last two years, um, they also invested a lot in uh, an analysis of the future of work under a so-called global uh, commission. And here what you can see is the summary, uh, maybe you can say the, the main chapters, the main slogans of their conclusions, investing in people's capabilities, well, not very revolutionary, but you know, joining the chorus. Um, uh, but on the other side, investing in decent and sustainable work and investing in the institutions of work uh, which would um, indeed deserve um, uh, uh, some kind of discussion because there are many, many innovative ideas they came up with in, uh, in, in, in this work. Um, and of course, not so important as the EU, the OECD or the ILO, but uh, the institutions I'm responsible for now, uh, the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, also produced an analysis, the platformization of work in Europe, uh, highlighting uh, uh, the developments from 13 European countries. And uh, uh, if you download this from the website, because it's all accessible, uh, then uh, you can find uh, a lot of uh, good analysis and summaries. Um, in fact, comparing countries, very interesting comparison of country experiences and identifying which countries are doing the most in order to address the risks associated with uh, uh, digitalization and uh, flexibilization in the labor uh, market. We believe that this is not only a collection of marginal issues, but one that requires a kind of complete institutional and to some extent political uh, reconsideration. Uh, this chart is supposed to um, uh, you know, explain this on 19th century data, uh, highlighting the gap between um, output and uh, wages, um, looking at long, long periods of wage uh, stagnation. Uh, which then were followed by some more dynamic uh, periods of uh, wage growth. And um, of course this is 19th century when Friedrich Engels uh, was studying the wage stagnation at the time of uh, uh, output growth and productivity growth. And uh, before coming to Brussels to write the Communist Manifesto, studied the conditions of the working class in England. And, um, of course, that was a time when uh, uh, growing inequality was um, observed. And, um, and then it took uh, a lot of institutional innovation. For example, the spread of the trade union movement to change the trends of wage uh, uh, stagnation and ensure that uh, different dynamics can also unfold. If you think this is a 19th century story only, you are wrong because the same uh, analysis has to be carried out in the past 20 years experience of Germany, for example. Why exactly wage stagnation uh, was observed instead of coupling wage uh, growth to be productivity growth? And what kind of institutional and political changes needed in Germany in order to ensure that wages actually uh, recover with the rise of uh, 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 productivity? So we believe that um, a, a lot of um, uh, dimensions of the same uh, trend have to be observed at the same time. And in the European context, we also can speak about the need for a new social contract, which has a skills uh, dimension, but also another one regarding uh, the social dialogue. Uh, the welfare state, um, where probably the promises of a, a, a universal basic income are uh, premature and we would need to, uh, uh, to, to, to think about the possibility of strengthening social services and taking into account the so-called European pillar of the social rights, not necessarily uh, in terms of lengthening the list, but actually implementing what is on paper in the European Union, and new institutions like the European Labour Authority should probably help in that. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, it's my job to wrap up before the discussion, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, 
the inequality aspects and some policies around that and try and tie that up with some of what you've heard. The little symbol on the uh, left there is um, announcing a new review. We're in just starting out on kind of launching a review into inequality, but not a kind of standard descriptive review, but trying to look at the drivers and the kind of mix of policies that you might need to address those. And I'm going to look here at earnings inequality and inequality in the labour market. Um, so thanks to ULB, Frank and everyone for setting this up. It's great. Uh, one thing we know is that structural work is changing and families are changing. So, and uh, I want to think of, um, of workers not alone, but workers in families, people, individuals in families, when we're thinking of well-being and incomes and inequality as well. And the structure, it reflects a growing in a, in earnings inequality um, for men and for women across the distribution. I'll show you some pictures in a minute of what that looks like. And with evidence of adverse labour market shocks for um, the low educated, for the low skilled, and uh, especially for men, actually. And I'll show you how that looks as well. That puts all kinds of pressures on not just the economic system, but the political system, and much of the uh, recent political discourse is um, somewhat related to this. And you might think about that as I go along. So what I want to do is briefly think about uh, some of the underlying and drivers of these uh, events and what the right mix of policies might be, reflecting a little bit on what we've just heard. One thing that's for sure is that uh, we can't address all the concerns about inequality, especially inequality in the labour market, simply through the tax and welfare system. Um, increasingly, there's a strain on the tax and welfare system, brought about partly, as we'll see, by the increasing underlying earnings inequality. And uh, we have to think of an appropriate mix here, and that's what I want to look at here. So the question I want to think of is how do we balance tax and welfare policy with other policies, some of which we've heard discussed, minimum wages, competition policy in the labour market, the product market, with human capital policies, labour market regulation, and other aspects like that. For example, at the top, how should we balance the taxation of top incomes with policies that try and target those rents, those large profit streams, competition policy, corporate tax policy. How should we think about those trade-offs? At the bottom, how should we balance tax and welfare benefit reform with increasing minimum wages, <coughs> training, with policies to address anti-competitive practices at work? I want to look at that. But let's first turn to some facts. One that we've already uh, have pointed out, that um, real, real wage growth has slowed across many countries. You can see uh, a few here. I point to uh, GBR, written just almost at the end here. The diamond shapes are the recent growth, and the, uh, the big bars are the uh, previous growth up to before the uh, Great Recession. And you can see... Uh, GBR has gone from a reasonable growth right down to zero, and that's a kind of key issue. But if you look across the board, if you look at Belgium here, uh, you see a similar thing. And there's a variety of uh, aspects of that. Of course, that's nothing to do with inequality or necessarily, uh, but it tells you what's going on in the labour market in terms of this fallback in productivity, which puts on all kinds of, or fallback in real wage growth, puts all kinds of uh, strains on uh, the system and our revenue base for tax and welfare policy. Let me look a little bit more closer at, at the UK and uh, dig a bit deeper into this. I could do this for any country. It turns out to be rather similar in many countries. It's very evidently the case in the US, but it's increasingly the case across Europe, and the UK is always somewhere in between. And this, what this tells you is the it's looking at male earnings in the UK over a 20-year period, and it says, let's look at across the distribution from the very lowest percentile, I'll look at the fifth percentile, fifth, the, fifth up the, uh, the 100 points up the rank of the 
uh, earnings distribution. See how growth has happened there in real earnings right up to the 95th percentile. There's kind of two things that you see. One is that it's, it's growing right across the board here. That means at the bottom of the distribution growth has been much less than at the top. What's rather shocking is that at the bottom of the distribution uh, there's been a real fall in earnings uh, for men in the UK. And this turns out to be true across many economies, actually. And uh, it might well, and uh, if I have the figures here, I'd show you, it's not uncorrelated with what we see in uh, the vote for Brexit and other political events that are happening. So it's going more than just, um, of course, the pure economics of this. At the top, I haven't even drawn in anywhere past the 95th percentile, because if I did, it would go right off the map. Earnings growth at the top has been huge. And that's, uh, this is for men, kind of interesting here. And uh, why might this have occurred at the bottom here? Well, there's two phenomena that have been going on that are partly contributing to this. And it's key in when we're thinking about this changes in the work environment and the new world of work. One is alternative forms of work. They're not particularly new, thinking of, um, of uh, what we've got here is uh, temporary work, involuntary part-time, those kind of phenomena. But specifically, I want to point to solo self-employment. That's where individuals are working on their own outside regular contracts. Of course, many people appreciate that. That's part of the flexibility they have. But as we heard from the last speaker, this typically comes, at least at the, for the lower educated, where most of this work is going on, with very little uh, access to training. Um, in the UK, you would have little access to training. You would pay no national insurance contribution, so you'd have no access to national insurance benefits, and so on. And I want to uh, come back to that. Typically, what this is associated with as well is more part-time work. And in fact, this phenomenon here in the uh, low earnings at the bottom is nothing to do with hourly wages. In fact, the minimum wage has been very successful in the UK, keeping the wage up with little effect on employment. What's happened is that although hourly wages have risen, the, uh, the, the, um, the link to the labour force has fallen back among low-educated workers, especially men, and they're typically working many few hours either through these alternative work arrangements, but if we just look at employees, actually, over this period, and what I've done here, I hope this works, is plot you uh, three quintiles. So the green line is what happened to the proportion of men in part-time work in the bottom 20 percentile of the distribution <coughs> of wages, okay? So um, when I started doing uh, labor economics, we we didn't really look at the uh, hours of men particularly. It was a little bit of overtime, but we used to think just men work full time. Well, there's been a secular change in that. You can see that at the <coughs> bottom of the wage distribution, there's this increasing detachment from the labor market in terms of hours of work. And again, you might think that's not unique um, to the UK. You see a similar thing, surprisingly perhaps, among young men in Germany and young women in Germany. And there's a kind of similar phenomena here. At the top, the top groups are, oh, yeah, that's, that's what that green line is. That's the lowest quintile. Uh, it's some strange symbol there. At the bottom, this is the middle quintile and the top quintile. And that just says, yeah, these guys just kept carry on working in full-time work. There's no increase in part-time work. So at the bottom of the distribution, there's this fall in male earnings and detachment from the labor market, somewhat associated with the growth in self-employment and new alternative forms of work, which I think is pretty key. It fits into a little bit of this, but it's a wider impact. It's got impacts <coughs> in what's going on with young families and what's going on in, uh, in political uh, polarization. Of course, what you might think is that um, if I put uh, women back into the picture and look at household earnings, well, women have certainly increased their earnings at the bottom of the distribution, uh, partly because they now work more. Um, but they, they've increased their earnings at the bottom of the distribution from working relatively little to working much more, at least over this period. But when I put it together with male earnings and create family earnings, the picture looks just the same as it did for men. In fact, uh, if you look at it closely, 
uh, you'll see that what, what's happened by looking at family earnings, there's no real declines. So women at the bottom of the distribution have made up the incomes, the decline in income of, that's happened to low educated men. By the way, there's, there's, there's very strong assortativeness here, as we would say. In other words, couples tend to match very closely on their wages. So at the bottom of the distribution for men, it's very like the bottom of the distribution for women. And that's a kind of key observation. In fact, as we were pointing out today, in the, in the US, that's become even stronger, that assortativeness on labor market outcomes. And so you've got this growth now that it, there's everywhere the sum, there's no negative growth in real incomes, but it's much stronger at the top. Again, I haven't put the top, because when you put a high-flying woman together with a high-flying man, and look at what's happened to their earnings, then it goes off the scale. It doesn't happen at the bottom. And that's uh, kind of interesting. So you might think, wow, that's a really serious growth in inequality. Uh, but if I were to tell you, if, if, if you ask one of my colleagues at the Institute what's happened to income inequality in the UK between, say, the 95th percentile <coughs> and the 5th percentile, or let's say the 9010, which is a common measure of inequality, they said there's been absolutely no change in inequality in the UK over 20 periods. So how could that be? Well, I'll show you how it could be. If you put together with the uh, what's happened to household income, it's a very different picture. And uh, you might not think it, but the UK does a huge amount of redistribution. What it does now, more than it ever did before, is give... Um, benefits to people, families in work. So in work benefits have become by far the most, the biggest source of, uh, of welfare support of working age families. So you find <coughs> families at the bottom of the earnings distribution fell, falling low, well below the poverty line and having to be propped up by welfare in work. And this is a, a feature of many economies now, particularly the US and particularly the UK. And so you can see that. That gap there is what's been made up by uh, welfare transfers, actually, and in-work benefits to families. And that's grown over a long period. It's grown, it grew so rapidly uh, that it became absolutely key in the political, uh, political discussion. That's a picture of the growth in billions uh, of the uh, transfers in terms of in-work benefits and other transfers going to working families. What's happening is that incomes are not growing at the bottom, earned income are not growing at the bottom at all, and so there's this increasing transfer to low earning families. And uh, that's a key issue. But you see it changes. But just after 2010, we get a new political, we have a new government, a government that didn't particularly want to support this any longer, and it begins to fall. There's real cuts from then on in all these transfers. So what was the uh, solution? The solution is the minimum wage, which didn't used to be a friend of, uh, of, the, uh, of the right of center governments, but it's become incre incredibly popular in the UK now, on both sides of the house, by the way. And uh, what you see is that uh, they thought of as substitution. Okay, we have this problem of low earnings. What's really going on here is that these welfare benefits are just supporting firms that pay very badly. And what we should do is increase the minimum wage and that will deal, deal with the problem. And it certainly does to some extent. But it's particularly not well targeted to low earning families actually, no income families. Um, and I can show you that, oh, I can't show you that picture because I don't have it here. But if you look at where uh, the minimum wage bites, where the minimum wage comes in, what it does is get more the kind of lower to middle uh, income uh, families and not the very poor families because the very poor needy families that get the transfers are really families that have, uh, say, large numbers that have children and not necessarily kind of single individuals on the minimum wage. And so the minimum wage turns out not to be particularly well targeted and what we think of is that these things, you could think of them as really complements. You want a little bit of both. But of course they're just, um, they just plaster over the underlying problem of the low earnings growth at the bottom of the distribution. And to get a little bit more into that, 
uh, you can, uh, it's, it, it, it's very depressing to be at the bottom of the labour market. And, if the, and the evidence is that it's getting more depressing at the bottom of the labour market and even in the middle of the labour market. What this tells you is the kind of average, it's just data, it's just descriptive of average of wages for women actually. It's even stronger difference for men. Of, of women by <coughs> basic education, high school education and university education, their wages, hourly wages over their uh, lifetime. Uh, average. And you can see at the bottom, you get a little uptick and then you go along on a very, very flat profile. And uh, you can do very serious econometric work, statistical work, uh, to look at whether this is really going on. And it really is going on. At the bottom of the distribution, it's very, very flat profile. So it's not just low wages or low wages at the beginning of working life. It's low wages right across, at least on average, your working time. So progression is very low in these uh, for low educated workers and that's uh, that's a kind of key feature behind this growth in inequality and the poor performance at the bottom of the distribution so some takeaways and then i'll come to thinking about uh, kind of options and policies here this little wage progression for the low educated and, uh, and for those in part-time work Work is no longer enough to escape poverty. So one policy reform that we had 20 years ago in the UK and in many places, if we could only get people into work, uh, then they'd earn themselves out of poverty. It turns out that's no longer the case. This is not the case that you're using uh, social insurance and benefits to prop up families and people when they hit a bad time. They hit a continuously bad time. and so. By being in work, they're not able to uh, earn their way out of poverty. This divergent profiles, the, the higher educated and more skilled seem to be doing much better. And uh, that's, of course, key here. Increased female labor supply, you could have thought, well, it's all about men. And uh, as women become more important in the labor market and their skills are more valued, uh, then surely that will make up the difference. Well, it certainly does make up some difference, and it's made inequality in some sense go down within families. But across families, because of this assortativeness, um, you still get uh, a strong earnings inequality increase. And at the bottom, it's still uh, very depressing for families with, uh, with low educated, low, uh, low educated, low wage workers. One solution, of course, is to have in-work benefits, that is to just prop up wages in work through uh, targeting low earnings. And that's been the key solution in the UK and to some extent in the US with earned income tax credits in the UK. It's been the Working Families Tax Credit. Um, it certainly offsets, it gives an incentive to be in work and that was the idea. It would get people into work and then they would, write, they would drive themselves out of those low incomes. That hasn't worked. Earnings progression, if anything, has got flatter, but it's certainly not been enough to, to earn people out of that. And incidents, maybe it is support, maybe it is, um, maybe it is helping firms keep wages down. After all, the state is providing part of the wage income, and we need to understand that. The minimum wage has lifted hourly earnings, but it's not well targeted to low-income families due to secondary earners, low attachment of some workers. And you've got to think of it really as complementary to in-work benefits. You could think about universal basic income, and I'll come back to that the very last thing. Uh, my guess is this is not going to work for a number of reasons. We've already heard it, but it's certainly a key issue here. Increasingly as well, minimum wage has a limit, we think. Increasingly affected by affecting workers that are vulnerable to automation. I just did, actually, for an earlier talk, um, I, did a, I took the work that David Auto has done on, on the, which groups of workers are most likely to be automatable, did that across the wage distribution in the UK, looked where the minimum wage was cutting. At the very bottom of the distribution, those are not very automatable jobs. They're service jobs, they're kind of care jobs, they're things that are very difficult to automate. As you've got the distribution, the proportion of jobs that are in that range, which limits the, the, the role of the, uh, the minimum wage.
So designing a policy. Wage prog progression is low for lower educated. Uh, what you, if you look at what's happening for them, uh, they have less training. The value of work experience is almost negligible. There's very low build-up of skills. What do we think potential policies there? Well, one thing is to avoid part-time incentives. It's not enough to get people in work. You really have to get them full-time work. is very important for people's career for progression. Including qualification training incentives, and I'll come back to that a bit. What skills are, are for lower educated are valued by good and growing firms? Some lower educated workers do very well in, uh, in, in firms. So what is it that is really going on there? And what we seem to find is that soft skills attract higher wages and are less likely to be outsourced. So soft skills might be a key, at least part of the key. And we might want to rethink firm-based training and the role of technology here to uh, think about that a little bit more. Do we need stronger competition policy and contract regulation? You already saw on David's first graph this, <coughs> this uncoupling of productivity with wages. So is it that increasing markups, that the markup, the, the kind of markup that firms get over their wage costs, does that suggest declining power, bargaining power? What about the solo self-employed, those working on their own and with zero uh, hours contracts? Do they find it more difficult to bargain? How should we think about that? There's two points here, I think. One is to act, improve access to qualification-based training. It's something we've always known, uh, but it seems increasingly key here, and we can see things that work there. Access to... Uh, Le legislative access to non-wage benefits and particularly job, job vacancy information. It's an old idea, but now with, uh, with technology platforms, it's very easy to give people access to the wide range of possible vacancies. And that itself can, of course, improve their bargaining position uh, in that way. One thing's for sure is we can't address all the concerns about low wages that have been happening through these various changes through the tax and welfare system alone. So we need to, uh, we need to think of a, what's the appropriate uh, balance. As I was kind of listening to everyone, the, the kind of two or three things kind of came out of it that I thought were, were, were particularly interesting and they're kind of key here. One thing is that people seem to care about work. They, uh, work means something to them. And not just work, but the earnings they get in work. And if you think back in policy, we first thought work was important, uh, but now we see uh, work alone, even if you top up their incomes, uh, isn't sufficient really. And what you need to think about is, is, is work that is work that's uh, going to provide sufficient earnings. You can think of minimum wages doing that, but minimum wages have their limit. We've seen that. They, they've done a reasonable job, but they're not so well targeted to low-earning families, and they're increasingly, I think, going into the automatable uh, zone there. So work alone is not enough. We need to make work better. Um, one, thing, one easy way to think about working work better is that do we need contract regulation? Our moves to zero hours contract, so, solo self-employed, are these ways where individuals are finding themselves in positions where they can't bargain, they have little access to training and little access to social insurance. How should we, uh, how should we think about, uh, about that? Training itself seems uh, pretty key here. Uh, we've thought about that a lot. And there are two takeaways here. One is that it has to be qualification-based training that people can take with them. We've learned that from German example, which has been the key success in this field. But also, maybe we should think about soft skills a little more. And what is it that's really valued, especially by people who've left the education system with relatively low qualifications? Is there a way of getting verifiable qualifications in soft skills? There is, of course, but it's very, uh, very slightly, uh, slightly uh, developed. One thing we clearly need to think about is how to make sure that workers recoup any productivity 
any, any way that they're missing out in productivity gains, maybe through bargaining and leverage, much like uh, we heard some of the discussion already. So there were just a few thoughts uh, on, on what are the kind of key issues around work and, um, and how to uh, support and think about uh, improving uh, low earnings in work. Okay. So. Thank you so much. I will ask you to present yourself and please a question and who you want to address it to. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Carl Frontman, MBA 2004, and this is for the whole panel actually. Um, we hear a lot about work being replaced by automation, AI, robotics, and every talk I hear anywhere around the globe always focuses on commercial environment. What about the public sector? Is the public sector prepared to deal with um, up and coming automation because uh, you have very strict employment rules there. You can't just change people's jobs, which we in the commercial world can do. My name is Francis Benoit, I graduated from this university in 1994 as a commercial engineer. And I actually, to answer this question, I'm thinking about an article that I've read that I received from my wife that was actually a commercial article produced by one of the big four in the UK. I think it was Ernst & Young. And actually they said that the artificial intelligence was not only to benefit the commercial companies, but first of all, the biggest benefiter of it was the government, and they were more specifically thinking about the tax authorities, and especially the ones in the UK. They mentioned, as, as far as I can recall, that there, there were two countries in Europe that were very progressive into changing their future labor of the, the, the government into, into automatization. It was the UK and the Netherlands. And from the UK, they mentioned that they had a program of spending one billion over five years, and they were in the middle of their spendings, actually at year three more or less, to set up a system of taxing the companies and in the future also the, the citizens uh, in a more automatic way. So I think that's part of the question to what my, what my neighbor has asked. I can add to that. Um, you're right. Yeah, that's right. So um, it's true. So. Uh, there's now real time, there's real time taxation of companies and individuals. There always has been a fairly automatic uh, pay as you go system in tax in the UK, and of course, automation has uh, made that. It, it's, um, it, it, it's more or less kind of month by month now, and at the Institute, we get real time updating of the tax payments of, of every, every agent in the economy, so it's uh, important. I'm not, I guess that improves uh, a number of things in, in government. Uh, it, it certainly makes taxes more immediate. Uh, uh, I'm not sure it kind of gets at whether, uh, whether there's any, uh, any effects on uh, productivity or jobs. It's a, it's a difficult thing to, uh, to get at there. Um, one billion used to be a lot of money, but now uh, 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 billions are spent all the time. No. Um, but, yeah, I guess in terms of uh, in terms of kind of, uh, 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 of access and information and government information, it would it, 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 there's, a, there's some kind of key advantages there. Whether we've really seen those, I don't know. I guess the one I was thinking of most uh, was the health service, and uh, there's a kind of huge <coughs> move to have AI in the way we deal between uh, hospitals, doctors, and patients, and there really is some huge technical innovation there and it's kind of uncertain how that's going to affect the jobs in the 
public sector, the health is in the public sector in the UK and most of Europe, so we think of that as an important component. But I think most people think of it also as a way uh, that people will access health care and health care information. So I guess in these uh, provisions of education and health by central or government authorities, there's a, there's a huge impact. Whether it's really had any impact on employment or wages in those sectors, I'm, I'm not sure we've seen that uh, yet. with the European Commission. Uh, thank you very much for very interesting presentation. We have heard a lot of, I would say, encouraging results regarding the benefits, certainly. Uh, but also a lot of uh, information on the important challenges. I'm wondering, is there any need for some kind of fine-tuning of the corporate governance? Is there any need for that? Uh, we have heard recently that in the United States, a large number of CEOs came up with uh, some suggestions as far as need, uh, moving away, let's say, for the quarterly uh, emphasis or the emphasis on shareholders, <laughs> enlarging, let's say, the stakeholders. So that's my question. I might even be wearing a microphone. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a great question. So uh, the U.S. more than any other country has embraced a sort of pure Milton Friedman version of shareholder capitalism. The only stakeholders, the only legitimate stakeholder of a for-profit firm is its shareholders, and everything else that it might focus on is, in some sense, uh, a distraction and, and socially counterproductive. And um, this idea was highly radical when Friedman proposed it in the 1950s. It then sort of became almost the norm in the United States in the 1980s. It was actually reinforced by the views of economists like uh, Michael Jensen and uh, his co-author Meckling. And uh, in many ways, it arguably has gone way too far uh, in the sense that it has uh, kind of made, uh, you know, given firms the idea that workers are disposable in the same way any other form of equipment or capital is. Uh, that when the rate, you know, the carrying cost of the capital uh, exceeds its, its short-term rate of return, you ought to scrap it. And uh, that ne neglects any costs to workers in terms of displacement, lost earning, psychic damage, neglects cost to communities. And, um, the pro and you know, at, some, at a point, at one point in history, even if corporations wanted to do that, you know, labor unions wouldn't have allowed them to. But the, the labor movement in the United States has so atrophied that there really is no countervailing pressure. I would say that it's it's been quite counterproductive, in the sense that uh, it gives firms you know reason not to invest in worker skills, and then when you haven't made much of an investment in workers, they then very much seem disposable. And you can compare that to a system like in Germany or in Denmark, uh, where there's a lot more investment uh, and a lot more sense that workers are kind of a valuable asset, uh, and so, but these are you know part of complementary systems. It's not just labor unions, it's not just corporate governance, it's also these kind of social partners. Um, so I think it's great that the US, you know, uh, shareholder, you know, corporate round table is saying these things about, you know, state shareholder capitalism has gone too far. I don't think they're gonna be able to do a damn thing about it, actually, uh, because it's not something that's subject to unilateral uh, resolution. Firms can say we want everyone to play nice, but they have every incentive not to. Uh, and so unless they can convince themselves that somehow they personally can you know, adopt a different model, that even when other firms are sort of ruthlessly uh, you know, minimizing the labor, that they can somehow invest more in workers and that will pay off, they won't be able to. So I think uh, there is an absolute need to restore some form of worker voice in the United States. I do not think it is by resuscitating our atrophied and calcified labor movement, uh, which is incredibly stuck in the past, uh, but more one that embraces the notion of kind of sectoral bargaining of social partners, not the kind of adversarial one-on-one. -on -one. So I, I do think, um, so just to summarize, you know, I think that this extreme form of corporate governance uh, has reduced investment in workers and made all forms of labor saving the kind of chief goal rather than investing in workers to make them more productive. If you talk to a CEO from a German company, they'll say, look, 
I don't get to reduce headcounts you know, at will. So therefore, a lot of my innovations can be directed at boosting productivity of existing workers rather than making them redundant. Uh, I would wish more people in the US were saying that. Maybe if I can add just uh, one thing. Actually, in the, in the US, you also even have a, a movement where you prevent workers from bringing their uh, human capital to the next firm with non-compete clause uh, that's quite active in, even in the tech, in the tech world. And there are some worries that this would even reduce uh, innovation. like the pension benefits, and those have kind of been disappearing. Yeah, there are many countries where um, the yeah, there are many con countries where um, the system do rely uh, heavily on uh, employers contributing to uh, pension uh, plans. I do think about the UK, where it's quite strong, and the fact that uh, the last 20 years it has been disappearing uh, in workers. But here I'm also thinking about the white collar workers. Maybe thinking. Uh, the, the impact you think is going to have, which is, I don't see it really in uh, presentation for the moment. And I have another question, so I have the opportunity to visit Shenzhen where uh, all the EA is going on for the moment. <coughs> and um, I was wondering how, um, what will be the future of redistribution when uh, you know that most technology will be there, innovation will be in Shenzhen or those kind of locations. And it will be kind of hard to tax that, and uh, we don't know yet how we will tax it. So how will uh, redistribution, which is a uh, turning of the story, uh, will work at that time? Thank you. Great. Someone brought, finally brought China in. So. <laughs> Some, but we should be directing innovations at important problems. And I think there, that, I, you know, 
when the government has led innovation, it's often led it towards problems that we thought were first order for our society. And one of the problems that, one of the things that direct innovation has not been directed at is complementing workers. Uh, and a lot of AI is really directed by this kind of misguided notion that we should make machines that replace us. Uh, and that's kind of the image that people have in mind when they're innovating. And that's not, you know, that's kind of interesting intellectually, but it's not clear that that's really the highest and best use of the technology. And we ought to be thinking about, you know, I think an incredibly important problem is making people more productive in healthcare, in making people more productive in service work, in making people more productive in a lot of the kind of mundane work of which there is a fair amount, but we're going to have a shortage of labor to do it. And if we can make people more productive in that work, we can also pay them a lot more. Uh, and uh, and you know, so there will be lots of benefits to doing so. So I think we should redouble our investment in innovation. And it, it is a shame that uh, much of, of Europe and the U.S. Uh, is you know, on a trajectory to fall behind China. Um, but it's not simply the amount, but also the direction. And if we don't think about shaping the path of technology, if we just think of our role as reacting to technology, how it shows up, we're really missing one of the key leverage points that's available to us. Thank you. Um, Now, if I did back, I'm, a, I'm a graduate of this school. And I am now an executive officer of a public company in the US. Um, so you've all demonstrated that uh, we've had the very same fear over the last 100 years of some sort of takeover of the robots, the automation, all of that. And, um, and not a lot of the public policies have really fixed either inequality or permanently stopped the rise of automation. Why do you think now is different and new policies have to be put in place to change the future? Is the market going to fix itself the way it has over 100 years? I, mean, I would not say that necessarily the market has fixed itself. Right? We, will, we have seen a huge increase in inequality. Uh, so I think that this is part of the consequences. The problem is that when people think about uh, robots are going to take their jobs, they literally think about people being unemployed. And that's not how labor markets work. The effect is people see lower wages or lower wage growth. And that's clearly a consequence of, I think, technological change uh, from you know, the last 40, 50 years. So policy is trying to somewhat compensate that, as uh, Richard Shaw with uh, changes in inequality. Uh, with, whether you look at pre-tax or post-tax, it's very different. Um, but the uh, effect on the pre-tax and uh, the rise of inequality, that's part of the technological change. So it's not new, but it's not without consequences. At the, at the risk of being a loud mouth, um, you know, people, we put up these things and we say, oh, people have been worried about this for 200 years, and yet it hasn't come to pass. And so the, re the lesson people often take from that is see it fixed itself. But I don't think that's the right lesson at all. I think we responded effectively to it. And the, the biggest way that we did that was by raising educational levels, which was mostly a public sector activity. Right, so in the U.S., you know, when agricultural employment was going to very steep decline, many of the farm states passed laws that required their children to stay in school until age 16, which was a crazy idea, because you had to build buildings, you had to buy books, you had to hire teachers, but most of all, those kids couldn't do agricultural labor the way that their parents did when they were ages you know, 10 to 12 to 16. And that investment in human capital was what allowed the U.S. to grow so rapidly and respond so effectively during the Second World War. And so we, it didn't take care of itself, and countries that didn't make those same institutional and human capital investments got left behind. So uh, it's not going to solve itself, and in some ways the, the tailwinds that, uh, that innovation gave us in the mid-century during the period of really rapid manufacturing growth were very favorable and inequality reducing because they made very productive use of people without high levels of formal education. We don't know how to do that now, and that's a very serious problem. Uh, so we should not think the future will take care of itself. It never has. One question I had actually related to this is how do you evaluate and this is in the policy making? What maybe is different and please contradict me in the past 200 years is the speed. The speed at which the technology is changing the market. And by the time regulators, policymakers come up, they've already been beaten. The next innovation is there. And do you feel the speed is part of the issue today? how fast this innovation is actually changing. It doesn't take a generation. It's three years and jobs are changing. And how, is that the biggest challenge for the policymakers? The, just the thinking time of how to address it and something new has come. 
Maybe, but maybe not, because um, I think um, in this case we would need to compare policy responses to technological change to other types of policy. For example, fixing the monetary union. And then, in principle, the monetary union would not be a very complicated system, but our leaders still fail to fix it. Why? Because this is also a political question. So sometimes it's, you know, it's not simply a question of whether the policymakers understand the complexity of the issue or can be mentally or physically speedy enough. That's kind of the worst possible place to be. You would like to have a lot of productivity growth without a lot of, without a lot of disruption. But you'd be willing to have some disruption if you could also have a lot of productivity growth. But having a lot of dis disruption without much productivity growth, that sucks. And that's where we are right now. A question to the whole panel. I'm one of hi, I'm one of the master's students here in political economy and a joint program with here in Georgetown. I wanted to ask a question about secular stagnation, or two questions. One which going off of what Dr. Artur just mentioned about how productivity growth is slowed. I wanted to ask, do you think that over time are we would we end up being in a state of secular stagnation or is this just a cyclical issue where things are just going to slow down, but they're going to pick back up? Like, we're going to enter a new like cycle of innovation? And also, what do you think the role of the developing world's growth, especially in areas like Africa, will have on the coming decades? Oh, David, 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 David happens to know the answer as well. Go ahead. <laughs> I don't know if I know the answer. I think it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think that you know, there, there are two, uh, two parts. One is secular stagnation, so lower productivity growth, and the second is uh, what happens to innovation itself. I think one aspect with, of the past is that we, you had productivity growth that came from innovation, but you also had productivity growth that came from other sources. So improvement in education, impro uh, women <coughs> joining uh, the labor force, that's going to lead to a lot of production growth, but increase in GDP per capita, uh, increase in trade, um, you know, removing different types of distortions. So these are all the bunch of sources of growth, potentially even productivity growth, that, that are kind of disappearing afterwards. And then you're left only with innovation. And so you would need actually faster innovation than in the past to probably maintain the same rate of productivity growth. That's hard to do. Second thing that you see is that, I mean, what we see in the data is it seems you need more and more resources into innovation to actually maintain a certain rate of, uh, of innovation. So we all know for the Moore's law of, you know, doubling of the transistor CP uh, over time, well, that, that, that's true, but that comes with more and more people working at it. So that suggests that there are some, you know, some decreasing return there. This is uh, Manuel Arellano, an uh, economics professor working in Madrid. Um, the, when it comes to thinking about uh, providing incentives to firms to internalize the environmental damage of their activity, there seems to be a, a well-organized uh, policy debate the options and pros and cons of different activities. Uh, when it comes to thinking about uh, the damage uh, of the activities uh, to work and society more at large, uh, there doesn't seem to be a similar debate. Uh, something is emerging from the uh, discussion that uh, we are having here. So the question is, uh, what, what are the responses uh, needed uh, from policy in terms of aligning incentives of firms regarding work and innovation? There has been talk about uh, training, complementary technological investment, investing in workers, but, but in terms of policy, where are we? 